Welcome to Europe ECR 2023 and to this discussion on advancements in the management of bifurcation lesions. My name is Dr. Ashok Seth from New Delhi, India, and I have with me today Dr. Rani Matthew from Kochi in India and Dr. Rishi Sethi from Lucknow in India. We're going to have a wonderful discussion around a very complex group of patients, the bifurcation lesions, which are increasing in our practice and always cause of concern for us. They are complex lesions. And over the past few years, we've learned through bench testing, through simulation models, better management strategies to treat such patients with safety and efficacy. So I think we're going to discuss a bit around that and to understand around how we have actually moved the science <coughs> further for these very difficult and complex lesion subsets. So Ronnie, tell me about the bifurcation lesions you treat in your practice. Do you see a lot of them? Do they concern you at all when you find a bifurcation lesion? Say it's got a large side branch and how do you assess these bifurcation lesions and decide to treat them? See, bifurcations uh, probably come to about 20% of the entire interventional procedures we right. do. And I think uh, the important thing of bifurcations is that there is a technical challenge involved because it's a complex lesion and the procedural outcomes are not too good. Long-term outcomes are bad. And no two bifurcations are the same. So there are no standardized techniques for these bifurcations. So in my practice, uh, the predominant bifurcation that I consider important are the ones that have a true bifurcation, that is a side branch, that is clinically relevant. And what I mean by clinical relevance is by any, bif any side branch that subtends more than 10% of the myocardium. So we've got many surrogate markers for that. Right. So I think... Any size of the side branch that you think is important in terms of uh, millimeters? Yes, so when I say a side branch is clinically relevant, it should subtend 10% of the myocardium, which translates into roughly a size that's greater than two millimeters. Right. Or a length generally considered by everybody as greater than 73 millimeters. And to, in my practice, I think it's generally the LADD one and the circumflex left main that are the most important uh, uh, Parts of bifurcation. So let me just understand this. I, that circumflex left mean the most important bifurcation, should we say, and truly uh, a lot of uh, concern as well as discussion around that happens as to the best way to approach the distal left main circumflex bifurcation. So, what in your practice is this percentage of complex left main circumflex bifurcation? So complex left main bifurcation, which we'll be thinking in terms of uh, being careful about protection of side branch. Uh, in cases of overall left mains that we do, it would be nearly around more than 50% in the, in the bifurcation that the left main situation is concerned. Mm -hmm. But in the overall clinical picture and overall percentage of patients, they would be somewhere around 10% of our population they would be considering that. So Dr. Rishi, let me just ask you, do you have a strategy which is different for native Vessel non left main bifurcation versus left main bifurcation as far as stent strategy is concerned, as far as choice of techniques are concerned. Can you just elaborate on how you decide on this? So, um, taking forward for what Dr. Rani was saying, that we need to have a side branch which is supplying a significant territory, which is almost always the case in left main, right. unlike, unlike the other bifurcations. Absolutely. Having said that, uh, you know, LED D1 bifurcation is also a close second to left main bifurcation mm -hmm. where, the, uh, where, the, where the diagonal is uh, more than, let's say, greater than 2 millimeters, let's say a 2.5 millimeter that we would consider. In the left main bifurcation lesion, apart from the size of the side branch, which of course always, always be significant, we also have to take into consideration, and we take into consideration, what is the probability of that side branch getting you know, occluded, uh, seriously compromised during the procedure, and therefore the angulation of that circumflex from the left main, the amount of disease at the ostium of the circumflex, and how long is that disease in the circumflex, and also the amount of plug burden in the native left main, all these things would be consideration that we would be taking into uh, our thought process uh, in, in deciding the strategy for left main. So, so, so uh, Dr. Rani, uh, let me get from you your choice of strategy. Say we're not now talking about non-left main bifurcation. 
What is your choice of strategy for a non-left mean bifurcation? Say an LED diagonal, large diagonal bifurcation. How would you approach that? Uh, and even for left mean, say, you know, it's see, a uh, Medina one one one. Yeah. In my practice, I think the default strategy for me is always a provisional stenting. When I mean a provisional stenting, I mean for true bifurcations, uh, you stent only the main vessel right. and uh, you try and open the side branch only with a balloon if necessary without putting uh, a second stent in. And I think uh, the decision is taken based on a lot of parameters, the plug burden, the differential size of the vessels, the bifurcation angle. And I think it's based on that, that you would decide whether to do a two stand strategy up front or a provisional. But to your question, my default strategy is generally the provisional. So you would actually therefore protect the side branch, prevent it from closure, but you would not necessarily stent it. And you would only have a layered approach well, from what I understand, that if the side branch was closing, it had a dissection or whatever needed to be bailed out, then you would go ahead and send the side branch in a provisional strategy. Absolutely. Right? Okay. So that's, that's, the, that's a nice way to proceed. So then, Dr. Rishi, then it brings me to the point that we have, and most of us do follow a provisional layered strategy for bifurcations. Correct. But what is your strategy? When do you do use upfront two cent strategy? You decide, you look at the vessel and say, oh, I'm going to have to put two stents in. Let me start with a two stent strategy rather than a provisional layered strategy. Uh, for, the, for the upfront two stent strategy, I would generally in my own mind classify the bifurcation as a high risk bifurcation or the low risk bifurcation. It's a given a fact that left main bifurcation that we are talking about, you know, uh, the size and the importance of the side branch you know, is, you know, is unquestionable. So what is the probability of it getting closed is, is something that we would decide. As already discussed, I would be dis it would be based upon the angulation and the plug burden and so on and so forth. However, another one thing that is also uh, you know, important in my mind is what is the clinical indication that we are looking at. Right. If we are looking at the acute coronary syndrome where the speed of the procedure is important and we have to deal with the culprit vessel and get the flow growing, I would rather you know, just keep it simple even if the side branch is important but if the condition is um, of a stable coronary artery disease, there's no point in treating the main vessel and continuing to have angina from the side branch. So in that case, I would lean towards a two stent strategy uh, up front. And, and that's, that's true. I think the choice of stents, and it's not just a technique, the choice of stents is also a very important factor in deciding yes. uh, around many of these strategies, whether it's provisional or two stent. And of course, the uh, amount of disease burden in the side branch, the extent, the length of the disease, are all very important indicators. Uh, so Rani, what's what, you, do you have a choice of stents in these sort of situations? We have the strategies, but always that's, that's, we have some preferences towards the choice of stents. Uh, what, is a, what are the factors that you consider uh, in deciding what stent would you like to use for a bifurcation, should we say? Generally, uh, uh, for me, a bifurcation lesion always requires imaging. So I generally image about 80% of all my bifurcations, uh, whether it's OCT or IVIS. So once you get to know what is the morphology of the plaque and uh, what are the actual sizes, the differential sizes, it's important to understand that you must take a stent that can differentially size. So suppose you take an LED to left main, the LED should be 3.25 millimeters, the LM should go up to 5.5. So one of the very important aspects that I take is the expansibility of the stent. Right. And I think the, another very important point is the access to the side branch, because uh, I think that there lies the crux of the bifurcation stenting. So, I would generally prefer a stent that has got a good side branch axis and uh, that has a good expansion and gives you sufficient radial strength, especially when it is a, a left mains. Oh, that, that's, that, that's all right. It, it then brings us to the point that know your stents well and know their expansion characteristics as well as the side branch lumen that your stent can create just in case you have to not just cross it, but even stent the side branch. So, so Dr. Rishi, that brings me to the point. Do you have a favorite among stents uh, for bifurcation lesions and why? Uh, so I think most of the newer generation stents uh, have the, almost the nearly the same kind of characteristics. So I would say that in terms of as a blanket practice, I would not say that you know, I would choose one stent over the other. Having said that, if we, if we dissected 
uh, too fine, and if we look to try to look at the lens uh, distance under a magnifying lens, then we would realize that uh, you know the the thinness of the struts I would be considering as an important factor because even for provisional, if you say, I mean, two stent definitely, but even for provisional, we say provisional does not translate into a single strength strategy. Mm -hmm. It only means that, you know, single strength strategy is an upfront strategy and we, we should be prepared to convert into a two stent strategy. Mm -hmm. So we have to have the same consideration for provisional as well as the two stent strategy. So in that case, I mean, I'd like to keep the metal at the carina as least as possible. So a thinner struts would be, would be beneficial. Of course, the amount of over uh, expansion a stent can achieve over and above its nominal size, which is especially important in the LED left main kind of situation, there would be a size mismatch and we want an approximation and, uh, of, of the uh, left main with the, with, the, with the expansion the stent to be achieved too. And then also what is the kind of geometry the stent has been uh, designed to have, the stent design has, implying what is the area of uh, a cell uh, in, a, in a normally expanded stent mm. and how much can we expand that normally uh, the, the cell area so as to ease the delivery of devices in the side brand. So all these factors would be... So the size the of area. the cells, in fact, the expansion yes. of the size of the cells that you create, yes. which is which also important, which brings me to the very important aspect, ultra-thin stents, uh, the new generation of ultra-thin stents. And, and we're lucky that we ourselves have in India, in our use, one of the well-used and well-proven ultra-thin stents, the Supraflex yes. screws. So, Ronnie, do you have, uh, uh, do you use Supraflex screws in your practice because it's an ultra-thin strength? Uh, does it have any advantages in your practice in bifurcation lesions? Yeah, uh, I do use Supraflex screws, and I think uh, there are some distinct advantages to the stent. One is, it's got a very unique Z connector. So, you know, you can get flexibility, and because of this uh, Z connector, and as Dr. Rishi was saying, you get a cell size, an area that's generally larger than other stents. So you get, have a greater access to your side branch. Your chance of a connector falling exactly bang on the ostium of the circumflex is less likely when you've got a larger uh, cell size. Recrossing is much easier. So I think overall, I think uh, Supraflex screws would be a, a good uh, stent for a bifurcation, ultra thin, large cell size. I think it ticks two boxes. Right, and, uh, and the ability to expand uh, to, to large sizes. So, so the taper is maintained, the physiological taper of the vessel can be maintained. So it seems a good stent for left wing bifurcations as well. Uh, one of the other, I think, uh, 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 plus points in all this is that uh, what you mentioned, Dr. Rishi, metal, thin metal, but, you know, as we, we always fear that bifurcations, when we, especially in two stent strategies, we're going to have a lot of metal at the carina, and therefore it's intuitively uh, correct to have thin struts so that you don't have thick metal sitting out there. So in your practice, do you use it in all forms? So here's a thin strut strength, and I'd say you've got a heavily calcified bifurcation. What's your experience for a thin strut stent in a heavily calcified bifurcation? Uh, so, before I answer that, I would like to continue on one important point that is important with this particular brand of stent, the Superfest Clues, is that whereas many of the competing brands would be discussing about their ultra-thin structure, uh, this particular stent, especially when we are using in large diameter stents in left main bifurcation, maintains that ultra-thin structure across all stent sizes, which is not so much so as the other, other brands. So that's one important thing considering left main bifurcation. As far as calcified lesions are concerned, I see no reservation not to use thin strut strengths because most of the uh, ultra-thin or thin strut, strut strengths have the radial strength, which is, which is very nice. The deliverability of the ultra-thin uh, is, is actually better. So I think I have no reservation in calcified bifurcation lesions using ultra-thin strut strengths. Of course, provided that we have prepared the bed well with whatever adjuvant therapy. And the basis is that you have to prepare, prepare the, the lesion well. Yes. And therefore, the thinness of the struts can only be an advantage and yes. never a disadvantage. Absolutely correct. I think those have been really pearls of wisdom from two very experienced interventional cardiologists from India, Dr. Rani Matthews and Dr. Rishi Sethi. Thank you very much for, for this discussion. Uh, we know that advancements in technology have played a major role in our dealing with these complex bifurcation lesions. And we're glad that uh, the thin strut, Supraflex screws, as we say, has proven a very advantageous tools in our hands, uh, especially in our day-to-day -day practice in these very complex lesion subsets 
whether it is a provisional strategy or whether it's a two-stent strategy. And I think these, these have been one of the advancements of science to benefit our patients. Thank you very much for this discussion. Thank you. Being here at uh, the Europe ECR 2023. Thank you. Thank you, sir.